Good afternoon and welcome to the 70th of the COVID calls. This is a daily discussion of the COVID-19 pandemic with a diverse collection of disaster experts. My name is Scott Gabriel Knowles. I'm a historian of disasters at Drexel University in Philadelphia. Today, we have a special Juneteenth discussion of the Tulsa massacre of 1921 with Hannibal B. Johnson. You can catch COVID calls live every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time on YouTube Live. Just go to the COVID Calls YouTube channel to watch. You can also hear COVID calls recorded as podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, Podbean, or anywhere you get podcasts. You can also keep up with COVID calls via Twitter using the handle at US of Disaster or at COVID Calls. Please do help spread the word and send suggestions for future guests and topics, and please feel free to suggest yourself as a future guest. As of today, June 19th, 2020, there are 8,550,458 confirmed cases of COVID-19 globally, according to the Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center. That's up from 8,407,325 cases reported yesterday. Of those, 2,205,307 are in the United States, up from 2,174,844 yesterday. There are now a total of 118,758 deaths from COVID-19 reported in the United States, up from 118,057 reported yesterday. As a way to bring some humanity to the numbers, I've been reading a life story or a story of advocacy for COVID-19 sufferers every day, and I'd like to continue that now. The headline is Israel Sow's gas station worker and new father dies at 22. The author is Manny Fernandez. This was published in the New York Times, April 13th, 2020. Israel Sows of Tulsa, Oklahoma, couldn't wait to see his first child, a baby boy named Josiah, and he couldn't wait for the world to see him too. So he got in close and took a picture for Facebook of his son, fast asleep in a green onesie shortly after the boy came into the world one Sunday in March. Just 21 days later, on April 5th, Mr. Sows was dead. He was 22. The cause was complications related to COVID-19, the disease caused by the coronavirus, according to family, friends, and the school district where he attended high school. Many in Tulsa may not have recognized his name, but they knew the smiling face. He was an assistant night manager at a busy quick trip gas station and convenience store about a mile east of downtown Tulsa. He was still a teenager when he first started working for Quick Trip, a popular chain based in Tulsa. He lived in the Tulsa suburb of Broken Arrow. He and his wife, Crystal, had celebrated their first wedding anniversary two weeks before Josiah was born. It's kind of been a shocker to people here in Tulsa, said Brendan Jarvis, one of Mr. Salas' middle school teachers at Union 6th, 7th grade center in Tulsa. There's this narrative out there that it's only hurting people who are already sick or older, and he doesn't fit that narrative. It took this pandemic to another level of seriousness in this area. Mr. Salas grew up in Orange County in Southern California and moved to the Tulsa area. He graduated in 2016 from Tulsa's Union High School, where he participated in an automotive vocational education program. This kid was the best, most respectful kid I've ever met in my life, said Ginny Ochuo, a Union High teacher. Some kids, they aren't there yet, mature-wise, so they're kind of like, hey, how's it going? What can you do for me? But he would really stop and ask you how you were and wait to hear your response and follow up on it. And that was something that really impressed me about him. Two GoFundMe pages have been started for Mr. Saus, one for his funeral expenses and another for his widow and son. The two pages have raised more than $30,000. I'd like to turn to our discussion for today and introduce my guest who I'm really thrilled to talk to, Hannibal B. Johnson. He's an attorney, author, and independent consultant specializing in diversity and inclusion in cultural competence issues and nonprofit governance. Mr. Johnson, a graduate of Harvard Law School, has served as an adjunct professor at the University of Tulsa College of Law, Oklahoma State University, and the University of Oklahoma. Mr. Johnson serves on the Federal 400 Years of African American History Commission body charged with planning, developing, and implementing activities appropriate to the 400th anniversary of the arrival in 1619 of Africans 
and the English colonies at Point Comfort, Virginia. He chairs the Education Committee for the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial Commission. Among Mr. Johnson's many books, I'll just give a few of the titles, uh, Images of America, Tulsa's Historic Greenwood District, Black Wall Street, From Riot to Renaissance in Tulsa's Historic Greenwood District, Up from the Ashes, A Story About Community, and he's the author of a play, Big Mama Speaks, a Tulsa race riot survivor's story, which has been performed at the Tulsa Performing Arts Center, Philbrook Museum of Art, and at the Just Governance for Human Security Conference, conference in Switzerland. And he has published two pieces this week, one in Newsweek and one just today in The Guardian, which you can find on my, um, on my Twitter page. Just go to at US of Disaster and you'll see it there about the 1921 Tulsa massacre. Hannibal Johnson, thank you so much for making time to come on COVID calls today. Absolutely, it's great to be here. I'd like to start our discussion the way I've been with, with most of my guests and just to get the sense from you how, how you've been, what's it been like, the COVID-19 situation, and, and I guess we start with where are you calling in from and get a sense of how it's been there with the pandemic. So I'm actually in my office, which is in the historic Greenwood district in Tulsa. And I would describe the COVID-19 pandemic as a surreal experience. Um, we are just last couple of weeks sort of reopening and I've gone to restaurants for the first time in a while. And um, I office in a suite of offices that is largely unoccupied. So I've been coming to my office uh, consistently since the since the shutdown. So that's really helped me psychologically because I couldn't I can't imagine being at home all the time. I just can't I can't do that. Um, so it's been um, it's been challenging. And we've had, I think, for the most part, a relatively uh, limited outbreak, although things are on a decidedly upward trajectory right now. <laughs> I saw that. I was just looking at the numbers right before our discussion, and it seemed that there were um, 1,457 uh, cases in Tulsa and 50 deaths so far. But as you point out, it seems that that upward trend is really the, the thing that's a little bit worrying right now. And the lockdown period there in, in Tulsa, was there a, a state ordered shelter in place or that was never issued for Oklahoma? I don't believe it was a state order. There was a, a locally mandated kind of shelter in place um, for a few weeks. Um, and there was difficulty getting our getting the, the state leadership to to, to, to be stern and, and rigorous about this. Um, so I think our, our local leadership was much more um, forward thinking and much more protective of the community in terms of imposing limitations that were designed, obviously, to keep us safe over the long short-term sacrifice long-term benefit was was our mayor's philosophy generally i think that was helpful mm -hmm. is that a, a a normal dynamic there in tulsa where the mayor and the governor are are somehow at at odds that's an interesting question because i don't i don't know that they if you ask them I don't know that they would acknowledge that they were at odds. I don't think they would use that, that phraseology. They're both in the same political party. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think they both want to put the best face on any kind of disagreement that they might have. Right. Well, sometimes mayors and governors, uh, even the same party, obviously they have different mandates and different things they have to get done. I want to ask you also if I couldn't get a, maybe you could get a sense from you of how the reaction to George Floyd's killing has been there in Tulsa and protest situation that might have gone on there? Yeah, so one of the things that makes me pretty confident in my assessment that this is an inflection point and, and not just sort of something that will, will sort of go away over the, the short term, this is a movement and not a moment, as some people would say, is that we had very large, very active protests here in Tulsa and in my 
hometown where I went to high school, Fort Smith, Arkansas, which is on the Arkansas Oklahoma border, small town of about 80,000. There were a number of protests over several days there. And in both instances, these are pretty conservative. Um, this is a conservative city and Fort Smith is a conservative town, I would say. In, in both instances, the protests were noteworthy for the diversity of the protesters. So here, my, my just sort of thumbnail assessment is that half the protesters were non-black. That's pretty remarkable when the protest was kind of under the umbrella of the Black Lives Matter, that phrase. Hmm. So if we've gotten, we've, we've definitely made some advancements when uh, that many people in the white community can be comfortable under that phraseology and, and understand what it means. I mean, Black Lives Matter emanated from a place where factually black lives matter comma two t-o-o is is the real meaning mm -hmm. so so for for a while after black lives matter emerged you know we had all these conversations about all lives matter blue lives matter red lives matter green light you know that sort of thing uh, but that that really is a denial of the historical origins of the black lives matter movement so I think today people are much more um, attuned to the real genesis of the Black Lives Matter movement and the support is much more broad based. That's fascinating describing that and, and others have described to me in their own places. I've been talking to people in the last few weeks, couple of weeks and asking that question and several have said something like what you said that, that um, who's at the protest? is a much more diverse group than what they had seen before. Have you seen something like that before in your uh, time? I don't know how long you lived in Tulsa, but have you seen anything approximating that kind of diversity in, in the street? Yeah, we have, a, we have a very strong nonprofit community here. We have a very strong philanthropic community here. So I was a part probably 30 years ago of starting what was called the Say No to Hate Coalition. So it was a group of individuals and organizations that were fighting hate. And, it, and, it, and, and early on in the history of that organization, it was a response to a Klan demonstration that was to be held in downtown Tulsa. And what the group decided to do was rather than host a counter protest, we decided to let the Klan hold their rally downtown. After their rally was over and they were gone, we took brooms and mops and dustpans and symbolically swept the plaza clean of the hate. Mm. It was a really powerful symbolic gesture. That is. That is. All right. So thanks for giving us those updates on, on what's been going on there with COVID-19 and, and with the protests. And what I'd like to do, so I was excited to, to talk to you in part because Tulsa's been in the news and we'll come to that discussion what's going to go on there tomorrow and and the president but it's also juneteenth and it's also brought into more popular consciousness i think um, massacre that happened there 99 years ago and you're on a commission to bring some light to that leading up to the 100th anniversary so let's talk a little bit about tulsa and and about the greenwood district and and what it was like 100 years ago there that made it such a vibrant African-American community, business community, arts community. Can you situate us that context for us? All right. I'm glad you use the word context because I think before talking about Greenwood, it's important to talk about the national context. Mm -hmm. So when we think about the national context, we think about what historians and sociologists talked about in describing the latter part of the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century. They called it the nadir of race relations in America. Nadir is a word that means the low point. Why did they call, why did they use that terminology? They used it because there was a proliferation of so-called race riots. These were mostly invasions of black communities by white vigilante groups. So in 1919, just two years before the outbreak in Tulsa in 1921, there were more than two dozen so-called race riots in the United States. The violence was such that James Weldon Johnson of the NAACP called the summer and fall of 1919 Red Summer. 
Red was a metaphorical reference to the blood that flowed in the streets throughout America, in towns and cities and communities all across the land. Simultaneously, lynching was happening all across the United States. Lynching is a form of domestic terrorism, often targeting a black male person, often for some real or perceived social slight or legal infraction. And the point of lynching really was not simply to penalize, often horrifically murder the target or the victim, but to send a message to the group to which that vic victim belonged about their relative place in society. So lynching is it really an enforcement mechanism for white dominance, white hegemony, white supremacy. Again, most lynching victims were black. So that's a, that's a really necessary predicate to talking about what happened in Tulsa in 1921. So the Greenwood community in Tulsa uh, dubbed Black Wall Street for the incredible black entrepreneurship and business prowess here was a segregated insular black community that abutted downtown Tulsa and was separated by the Frisco tracks. It became really successful as an economic island because the mainstream economy was cut off for the most part to people who were black. So it was a need to establish a place where people could ply their trades and purchase goods and services um, that they needed to, to survive on a day to day basis. The other thing that was helpful in terms of the financial health of the black business community here in Tulsa was the relative wealth of people called freedmen. The freedmen are people of African ancestry who were members of the five civilized tribes, hmm. Cherokee, Muscogee Creek, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Seminole. People might know that those tribes were forced to relocate to Indian territory, what is now Oklahoma, from the southeastern United States in the 1830s, 1840s. All those tribes practiced chattel slavery. So a number of African-Americans lived among the tribes, some enslaved, mostly enslaved, but some as free persons. After the Civil War, in which the five tribes sided officially with the Confederacy, after the Civil War, the tribes executed treaties with the federal government. Most of the tribes made their former slaves citizens of those tribes. But again, after the Civil War, in pursuant to the work of what was called the Dawes Commission in the late 1900s and the late 19th century and early 20th century, Indians who held their land in common, these five tribes did, they, they divided their land into individual parcels or the federal government did that for them or some would say mm -hmm. to them. Mm -hmm. So these people of African ancestry who lived among the tribes or were members of the tribes received land allotments, accessions to wealth. And so they were relatively well off. Uh, certainly vis-a-vis -vis other people of African ancestry in the United States. That wealth helped propel communities like the Greenwood District in Tulsa, like Wall Street, successful black business communities in places like Muskogee, Oklahoma, about 50 miles from here, mm -hmm. and the all black towns like Clearview, Bowley, and Langston. Oklahoma had more than 50 all black towns throughout its history. Mm -hmm. That Friedman wealth is really a part of the uh, economic mix for these communities. So the massacre really destroyed wealth in Tulsa, and it really disrupted what could have been an intergenerational transfer of wealth. We know that typically in the United States, a uh, typical black family has one tenth the wealth of the typical white family. And part of it is there are all these disruptors throughout our history that, that made it impossible for black folks to transfer their wealth intergenerationally. So that's an extraordinary history, just getting to that point. And the segregation, I mean, it's, it's, it's a much more complicated um, regional story. And we're talking about, like, say, Philadelphia or Chicago. Obviously, there are neighborhoods um, in which the color line is enforced um, de facto and de jure in some cases. Um, but there's still a lot, I would say, integration is too strong, but economically, um, it's a slightly different picture than what you're describing and a different historical trajectory as well. That's really, really important. Was there already um, a legacy? You were talking about 1919 and that red summer. Was there already a, a legacy of lynching there in Tulsa or a sort of tradition of kind of sundown or, you know, 
either violently or threateningly enforced sorts of racial racial codes there? So you've raised actually a lot of interesting, uh, complicated points. So Oklahoma became a state in 1907. So prior to Oklahoma's statehood, um, it, it's a really complex history. There is the land openings whereby uh, o- what was called Oklahoma Territory, part of the Twin Territories, was opened up for general settlement. Some of the people who came in the land runs in 1889, for example, were black people. Some of those people began to recruit other black people to come to Oklahoma to move mm-hmm. west on the theory that Oklahoma was a, an escape from, from the kind of oppression that people faced in the Deep South. Right. The first act passed by the Oklahoma legislature at statehood, though, was a Jim Crow measure that rigidly segregated railroad facilities. Hmm. So you have the irony of migrants coming to Oklahoma to escape uh, the sort of crucible of racism and Oklahoma then mimicking that at statehood in 1907. Lynching is a phenomenon that happened in Oklahoma as well. So from statehood to, to 1921, the date of the massacre, there were a number of lynchings in Oklahoma, probably the most notorious being the 1911 lynching of Laura Nelson, a black female, and her son, Lawrence, in Okima. Okima is the home of Woody Guthrie. And really? Woody, Woody Guthrie actually was, was witnessed this lynching, was taken to the lynching by his, by his father. So the Laura Nelson lynching in 1911 is, is and, and, and that of her son Lawrence is really noteworthy. The other lynching that's noteworthy and significant with regard to the massacre is the fact that just a year prior to the massacre, so this would be 1920, there was a lynching in the Tulsa area of a white boy, teenage white boy, who had been accused of murdering a taxi cab driver. His name was Roy Belton, and he was taken out of the jail by a mob, taken to a public space, and lynched, hanged. According to eyewitnesses, law enforcement officers directed traffic to this public spectacle, and people fought for scraps of his clothing because they wanted souvenirs to prove that they had witnessed this horrific um, murder, which is what it was. That kind of atmosphere, um, that kind of fraught atmosphere with with Mm. violence and incivility um, it is the backdrop against which the 1921 Tulsa race massacre occurs. I see. Okay. Well, that's all just really important context. And the Ku Klux Klan was resurgent in Oklahoma at that time, as it yeah, was in so, other parts of the country. Yeah. So at least, or at least in the early 1920s, the, the beginnings of the Klan presence, it's documented in Oklahoma, swelled tremendously mm-hmm. during the 1920s in Oklahoma. Klan had a huge presence in Tulsa and in Oklahoma after 1921, after the massacre. you mind if we talk just for a second about terminology? Because I've noticed in your writing um, and even our conversation, you've ter- used the term massacre. <clears throat> and you know, throughout American historiography, we talk about race riots and you hear the term riot. It does feel to me that there's an important distinction between a riot and a massacre. And you were clear in the way you spoke of that earlier, but I'd like to draw you out a little bit in the way you think about those those words. And the way I think about it is much more complicated than you might imagine. So so mm-hmm. I use the word massacre because it's the word that's been adopted popularly in this community because I understand people want to take ownership of the event and, and call it something that they think is more reflective of what actually happened. But my thinking is actually more complex than that. And I have, I have a new book coming out next month uh, called Black Wall Street 100. And I, in the early part of the book, I talk about nomenclature or terminology. Mm. So, so my view is this, race riot is a term of art. It is a, is, a, is a term that has a really special meaning that was developed at a particular time by particular people for specific reasons. So when you do your research on these events, you will be confronted with the term race riot. We can't erase that. It's not going anywhere. Um, so, so when you see the term race riot, though, I suggest that what's important is critical thinking. Ask yourself, who named these events? Who was not at the table when this, these names were given out? 
what is the significance of calling these events race riots? Once we actually know the factual matter and, and we, we can sort of appreciate what happened, what would we call the event? And then finally, if such an event were to occur today, what is the process by which we would name it? And what would be the result? For me, the critical thinking is what's really important, not where you settle on, on what to call it. Because if I were looking at, at what happened in Tulsa, I could call it a race riot. We could talk about that. I could call it a white race riot. Mm -hmm. I could call it a pogrom. I could call it an assault. I could call it an ethnic cleansing. I could call it a genocide. I could call it a disaster. I could call it a catastrophe. I could call it an eruption. There are all sorts of things that apply, yeah. but they all have certain limitations uh, and they all reflect a certain connotation. So let's have this discussion that we're having now about nomenclature mm -hmm. because we're, we're all going to be better off. We're all going to be richer for having had the robust discussion. What I don't like is people who insist that you can't call it a riot. Or you can't call it a massacre. Yes, you can. You can. Because all those terms have appl have application. The, the question is, what is the best descriptor that we can come up with today for the events that happened then? Mm -hmm. I cannot wait to read this book. And in part because of that, that what you just walked us through as a historian, it makes my head tingle to think about that relationship between what we call something today, but also what it has been called historically. And that that conversation across time is where we find, I think we find a lot of meaning. Yes, absolutely. Um, and so may I ask then, what do you call um, what's occurred in Minneapolis and in other cities in America? Have you in your own mind settled on what kind of language to use on in that? Or maybe it's an open question for you yeah, at this I think, time. I think a lot of things happen simultaneously. I mean, there, there were, I think there were protests that were mostly peaceful. Um, right. There were incidents of uncontrolled civil unrest, which is what I think people might refer to as a riot. Mm -hmm. And then there were incidents of what you might call hooliganism. People who are opportunists who took advantage of the situation because they wanted to loot um, and destroy property. So I think it's possible to have all those things occur simultaneously. Well, thank you for that. I, this is this kind of, I write and think a lot about disasters and this issue of how we even name a disaster is exactly as you say, it's so perspectival and can change across time. I'm open to that, to that dialogue. I want to remind people you're listening to COVID calls. I'm talking with Hannibal B. Johnson today, and you can get your questions in to the YouTube live chat. Just put them right there in the chat, or you can email them to me. Sometimes people do that in the call. My email, sgk23 at drexel.edu, or you can put them up on Twitter. Just be sure to tag me at US of Disaster. So we, you helped us. You developed some context for us. And let's talk then a little bit about the massacre itself, um, what happened in 1921 in Greenwood, who were who was involved, what touched it off, and what was the resolution? I think initially I, I will say that Tulsa was a tinderbox or a powder keg in 1921. So there are a number of stressors on the community dynamics at the time that are the foundational causes for the eruption in 1921. So we had the systemic racism that existed in the United States writ large. We had land lust, which is the way I described the um, documented evidence that there were moneyed and, and, and powerful interests that wanted the land on which the black community sat. They wanted to use it for other purposes, uh, railroad depot and other industrial purposes. So there are people who wanted to move the black community farther north and take this land. There was um, what I describe as cognitive dissonance uh, because white supremacy was a thing at, at the time. And if you are a white person and you're not faring well economically and you look across the tr tracks and there are these people who are inferior to you, who have a high degree of home ownership, who are driving cars, who are wearing nice clothes, have homes that are furnished with nice things, including pianos, fine china, 
causes cognitive dissonance, garden variety jealousy, um, mm. something that that says the world is askew based on my 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 race tinged philosophy. The Klan had a presence um, in fomenting the disruption here. The Klan begins in the early 1920s in Tulsa and Oklahoma, swells throughout the, the decade. And then the media, interestingly enough, um, we talk about the role of the media in society today as well we should. Um, it was no less a, a topic of conversation back then. When we, talk, when we talk about the media then, we're talking primarily about newspapers. So it was a daily afternoon newspaper called the Tulsa Tribune that published a series of incendiary inflammatory articles. They really fanned the flames of hostility in the white community against the black community. Those are the foundational causes of what happened here in, in Tulsa and what created this tinderbox. So all that was needed was an igniter, a catalyst to set the community alight. And that is a, this trigger incident is something people might be familiar with, the so-called elevator incident. On Monday, May 30th, 1921, Dick Rowland, 19 year old black boy who shined shoes downtown needed to use the restroom. Tulsa was segregated. His options were limited. One of which was uh, a restroom on the third floor of the downtown Drexel building. Dick Rowland went over to the Drexel building. He entered the elevator Elevators back then were manually operated. A 17 year old white girl, Sarah Page, was operating this elevator. Something happened on the elevator, caused the elevator to jerk or to lurch. Dick Rowland bumped into Sarah Page. Um, by some accounts, he stepped on her foot. She began to scream. By some accounts, she slapped him. The elevator wound up back in the lobby. He ran from the elevator because he was frightened as she screamed. She was distraught. She exited the elevator and was comforted by a clerk from a store called Renberg's. She told him her story, which assumedly involved an assault. Mm. And had that been the end, it might have actually been the end. There may have been no massacre. Right. She would go on to recant the original story. Dick Rowland was arrested for assault, but she wouldn't co cooperate with prosecutors. Um, and she recanted the assault story. But the Tulsa Tribune, that daily afternoon newspaper I described, published an account of the elevator encounter. And it was called Nab Negro for Attacking Girl in an Elevator. It was a false narrative that really painted the picture of an attempted rape by this teenage black boy on this teenage white girl in public, in a public space in broad daylight. So if you are a subscriber to the Tulsa Tribune, if you believe it to be a credible paper, then of course you would be alarmed. A large white mob began to gather outside the courthouse because the jail was located on the top of the top floor of the courthouse. The sheriff, Sheriff McCullough, shut off the elevator to the jail. He stationed guards in the stairwell to protect Dick Rowland. But there were rumors about town that the mob was going to seize him and take him out and lynch him. Black men got wind of the rumors. Several dozen bl black men marched down to the courthouse to protect Dick Rowland. Some of the men were vets from World War I. Some of them carried weapons and they knew how to use those weapons. As you might imagine, words were exchanged between the large white mob and the smaller black group. One of the white men tried to take a black man's gun, the gun discharged, chaos ensued. So over the course of the next 16 or so hours, violence persisted. The National Guard came in from Oklahoma City to quell the disturbance on June 1st in the afternoon. But when the dust settled, some 100 to 300 people had lost their lives. At least 1,250 homes were destroyed. Schools, churches, and business places were destroyed as well. Uh, property damage conservatively estimated at the time was 1.5 to $2 million present value of that is well over $25 million. People of African ancestry were interned during this period, very much like people of Japanese ancestry were interned during World War II. So they were taken to these detention centers throughout town. And generally to get out of the detention centers, you had to have a green card, an identification card that was countersigned by a white person who would vouch for you if you're black. 
Many black families spent days, weeks, months living in tent cities set up by the Red Cross. And by all accounts, the Red Cross did a wonderful job um, in the immediate post massacre. Maurice Willows was a man from St. Louis who was sent to Tulsa to manage the Red Cross effort. And the Red Cross was described by both black Tulsans and white Tulsans as angels of mercy because of the great job they did in providing health care, food, shelter, and clothing. There are a couple of historic white churches downtown, First Presbyterian Church and Holy Family Cathedral that provided food, shelter, and clothing as well. And there were a number of stories about compassionate white citizens who sheltered black folks who were fleeing this violence. For example, some white families employed domestics. They heard of the disturbance over in the Greenwood community. They kept their domestics on the south side of Tulsa to protect them. But the story really is the story of the human spirit, because even in the face of this disaster and the odds that people faced after the disaster, substantial quantity of black folks remained in town, rebuilt the community. The community peaks as a business community in the early to mid 1940s. Well over 200 black owned and operated businesses in the Greenwood community on Black Wall Street in the 1940s. The community then declines beginning in the 1960s through the 1980s, based primarily on two things, integration and urban renewal. One of those things, integration might seem counterintuitive because I hope that we all embrace integration generally as a positive value. It wasn't in terms of sustaining a black business community that was created out of necessity based on segregation. So integration, allows dollars to flow outside the community and undermines the financial foundation of of the, the business district and urban renewal urban renewal is or historically has been uh, problematic in communities all throughout the united states because uh, many of the urban renewal initiatives like the location of highways as has happened here in tulsa right. um, they chose paths of least resistance in other words a lot of these things were done not with and not for, but to communities of color. In, in Tulsa, Interstate 244 barrels right through the heart of what was the teeming Greenwood Business District. And it had, had a deleterious effect on the, on the community. So today, the Green, Greenwood community is fully integrated. It's an amalgam of different interests, commercial, residential, educational, cultural, entertainment, religious, much of the land is not owned by black folks these days, but the community really is trying to unify and work together uh, to preserve the historic character of the community and to make sure that, that everybody has, a, has an equal and fair opportunity to not just survive, but to thrive in this historic district. Well, I want to, I absolutely want to come come up to the present. And before we leave 1921, though, I want to get to a question here by Sarah McBride. And I'm glad she's asked this question because it's on my mind, too. She's asking back to our discussion about nomenclature. And she's interested in how journalists and editors at that time um, framed the events and the aftermath. So you gave us that headline from the newspaper. I'm assuming there was also a black press, but it may maybe there was uh, at that time. And I'm, I'm sure you've read everything that's available. So how, how did different media sources frame what happened there? Was it covered in other cities in Chicago and St. Louis or Philadelphia where they had strong black press? I'm really interested in how different yeah. people saw it. It was covered nationally. And in Tulsa, there were two black newspapers, the Oklahoma Sun and the Tulsa Star. Uh, the Tulsa Star was the primary black newspaper and it was a, uh, um, in, in some ways, an, a black advocacy vehicle. A.J. Smitherman was the editor and publisher of the Tulsa Star. He was a, ch a black civil rights champion. I mean, he took great risks to, to champion um, black civil, civil rights. Um, these events, the massacre itself was covered in newspapers all across the nation. And it was covered, uh, again, with a realization about the historical context. So. What happened in Tulsa, I describe as being emblematic of the kind of racial violence that, that happened elsewhere. So it was not stunning that there would be a, a so-called race riot because there had been many of them 
before, and there are many of them after. So we, we need to keep that in mind. In terms of uh, specific newspapers in Tulsa, there were two white papers, the Tulsa World, and which is still around, and the Tulsa Tribune, which was that daily afternoon newspaper that I referenced early, earlier. So the way that they covered it was somewhat different in that the Tulsa Tribune was much more derogatory and inflammatory than the Tulsa world, right? But, but we still lived in a, in, a, in a community and in a country that was white dominated and largely embraced a, a white supremacist philosophy. I will tell you that the Tulsa Tribune, the paper I mentioned earlier, on June 4th, there was an editorial in the Tulsa Tribune. So June 4th would be three days after the near annihilation of the black community in Tulsa. The Tulsa Tribune published an editorial really addressing the question of how, how should the community be rebuilt, if at all? And the title of the editorial is, and it signals everything, it must not be again, was the title of this editorial in the Tulsa Tribune. The first sentence was, such a district as, as this old nigger town must never be allowed in Tulsa again. It was a cesspool of iniquity and corruption. That's the beginning of an editorial after part of your community has been obliterated. That's amazing, it's truly amazing. Mm -hmm. And I tell people, you know, part of the reason I share that vile editorial is that it says something about the black people who were able to rebuild and rebound in the face of that sort of venom from part of the leadership of the community. Mm -hmm. Extraordinary courage to, to stay and go back and, and rebuild business. And then as you, as you talked about, of course, then to make it through the depression and, and World War II and everything that followed after that and urban renewal and to try to weather those different uh, those different eras, each with its own different form of structural racism, uh, sort of adapted to its to its moment, and and that's been very much, of course, in the converse, national conversation now. I'll come back to something you said earlier. You thought what's happened right now, right now, after George, after George Floyd's George murder, George feels, murder, feels murder, more like the moment. moment. And and so I want to I want to come to that and ask you a little bit um, about that. And maybe the way that the massacre is remembered and and these two events somehow bringing them into the same frame you know the discussion of reparations for example for slavery and i would seen a little bit of discussion maybe of reparations for what happened in Tulsa in 1921 had been almost um, it's not a completely absent conversation but not a mainstream conversation up until much more recent times. And now I believe that it's moved much more into a mainstream conversation. Just to give one example, I guess I wanted to sort of open up that area of conversation with you, you know, thinking right now in the context of that hundredth and that centennial coming up, George Floyd's murder on our mind. What's possible in Tulsa to reinterpret what happened in 1921, to find meaning in it, to find justice in it, maybe in healing? I'm curious how you approach that. Well, as I mentioned, I'm um, the education chair for the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial Commission. So we've um, part of part of what we're doing uh, is directed toward reparations in in the sort of general sense. So I'm a big I'm a big on subtlety and nuance. So when we when we toss out terms like reparations, it's important to think about what we really mean because I find that what when 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 most people bring up the, the word reparation, they're talking about cash payments to individuals. That, that's, that's really not what I'm talking about. That, that's, mm -hmm. a, that's a possibility. What I'm talking about when I talk about reparations is making amends, to, to try to make things right as best we can based on our past. So that could take a number of forms. So I would say that what we're doing at the Centennial Commission is, is a form of, of reparation in that we, for, for example, we're building a world-class $25 million history center called Greenwood Rising. So the people who come to Tulsa and people who are in Tulsa 
can learn that history in an experiential, immersive way. And at the at the end of the experience, we want people to discuss and dialogue and debate how the history relates to current day challenges like Black Lives Matter, like mass incarceration, like disparities in healthcare and education. What is it from this history that can we leverage to have a meaningful conversation that's solution oriented around present day challenges? So it's, it's tying together the past and the present and arguably the past is not past anyway. The past is part of the present. Right. So that's that, that that's one of the things that we're doing in the Centennial Commission. And the other thing that we're doing that's important is that we're trying to. I would I would use the terminology. Rekindle the Black Wall Street mindset. So in other words, we, we have a history here that's rich with entrepreneurship and economic success. That history is not moored specifically to Tulsa. That history is in part a state of mind. And what we need to do is make sure that we understand the history, we celebrate the icons, and that helps us realize our potential in the economic realm. Because we, what we want, particularly for black children, is to, for them to understand that, yeah, you might be the next LeBron James, or you might be the next Jamie Foxx, but statistically you you actually could more likely be the next simon barry or the next ow Gurley or the next you know entrepreneur or business person or lula williams the next black business woman uh, those are things that are within your grasp but if you don't know your history you don't you you don't know about the, the possibility and you're not motivated to elevate yourself to the, to, to the challenge. So we have incredible black entrepreneurs and, entrepreneurs and business people who did things a hundred years ago against challenges that we will never face, which is not to say that, that struck, you use the word structural racism, systemic racism, institutional racism, it's real and it's ever present, but it's nothing like it was a hundred years ago. <laughs> is mm -hmm. we're never going to face the, the, the challenges that those people faced. So if you understand that they were successful in a big way and rose to national prominence, then I think it's easier for you to embrace the possibility that you can do whatever you want to do, wherever you are, and your markets are, are much more expansive than theirs were. Mm -hmm. I want to come to something you published today. I mentioned earlier the Guardian piece and, and of course uh, Tulsa has been in the news in the last week because uh, we had talked earlier about the COVID-19 cases on the rise in Oklahoma and other states across the South and the Midwest. And also that the president is launching his reelection campaign. Basically the first big rally that we've seen since COVID-19 has struck the United States is gonna take place in Tulsa tomorrow, originally scheduled for today. And I just want to give a brief quote from your article. The president's inaugural mass meeting in advance of the fall election comes at a striking moment in the history of Tulsa and the nation. Of all possible times and venues to launch a re-election bid, this choice reeks of insensitivity, poor judgment at best, calculated callousness at worst. Uh, we've been having a constructive, positive conversation, but I think we have to address this. And, and your words there are powerful. I wonder if you could just say a little bit bit more, not necessarily asking you to try to figure out what's in the president's head, but what does it mean for, for Tulsa, for him to be there at this moment and also with the risk of COVID-19? Yeah, I, I, generally I would just say the rally is a disruptor because we've been on this, this path toward what people would commonly refer to as reconciliation. So we've been working hard to bring the community together as we inch closer toward the 100th anniversary of the massacre, which is really a seminal event in, in Tulsa history. So I serve on the Centennial Commission. We've had great success in a capital campaign raising money to build this world-class museum. 
uh, to build a pathway to hope that connects various sites in the community, uh, to award grants for create creative uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, we've, we've done all those things with a the, with the wide base of support, obviously not just in the black community, but in, in all sectors of the community, the government sector, the nonprofit sector, and the, the for-profit corporate sector. We've had, we have had great success. This is a distraction and a disruptor. And it comes at a, at a most inappropriate time because we are just a little over two weeks removed from the 99th anniversary of the massacre, kind of a solemn occasion. The venue for the rally is really a matter of blocks from historic Greenwood District, the sacred ground. Mm. This weekend is Juneteenth and there are celebrations for Juneteenth that celebrates freedom. Uh, we know, at least we know based on history, that the content of the rally is likely to be a content that doesn't necessarily promote unity um, and inclusion, like, like we're trying to promote here in the community. We have an uptick in COVID-19 here in Tulsa, so it's scary that we're going to cram people into the arena. Its capacity is what, roughly 19,000 people, shoulder to shoulder. Masks are not required. The, the campaign apparently is going to give out masks and um, gloves and sanitizer. And that's great. That's wonderful. But there's no way of insisting that people use those things. Uh, the people who are in the rally are at some point going to come out of the rally and they're going to going to be dispersed into the community. So what does that mean for for us um, as a populace? Is it going to be a hot spot? Are we going to have to shut down again? I mean, those are all things that make it really problematic. And I know our our leading public health experts have said, you know, can't we just postpone this thing? Right. It's not that we don't we don't welcome it. Um, we will welcome it, um, but not now. Why now? Right. You expect a, a counter meeting a counter rally some sort of oh, protest yeah. activity oh, yeah. there, will, there will be so it's going to be quite a weekend there in tulsa yeah i saw an, i saw something online and maybe that maybe the headline is just off but it, but it suggested that our mayor was predicting violence and i, I think that's probably not true um there, there may be something that happens but i, I suspect that it'll be quelled i know that there are uh, 250 i think national guardsmen in town uh, part of security detail. I know our police force is, is working on this this event. I know that everybody's doing everything in their power to keep people safe and secure. So my hope is that at, at a minimum, there's no there's no physical violence. Right. So I want to remind people you're listening to COVID calls and talking today with Hannibal Johnson about Tulsa and the 1921 massacre, but also the memory of that massacre and the possibility for reconciliation. I want to, to I didn't want to lose this moment. Uh, Hannibal, how can we learn more about the Centennial and about the History Center? All things Centennial re related are accessible through the website. I'll just direct people to the website, which is Tulsa2021.org. So you can go on there and donate, you can go on there and volunteer, you can learn about what we're doing in the area of education and curriculum. Um, all things uh, Centennial related um, should be accessible via the website. If there's something that's missing from there, there's contact information, you can contact the office and talk to the project director. Okay. And I'm assuming if people feel like that's a uh, a cause that they want to donate a little bit to and, and help that success, they can do that right there on that website, I'm imagining. Absolutely. Great. Um, Nothing is too small. $21, yeah. $210, $2,100, hey. $210,000, $210, whatever. <laughs> Good. The various increment possibilities are almost endless. Um, I wanted to, to come to something that was in your, um, in your biography because this is a lot on my mind if we think about, I've been talking all week with emergency managers, I've been talking with um, different experts who, who are trying to understand structural racism, problems that we face in America today. 
um, in that regard, and ways to communicate and teach in many instances. And, and you're an educator at many different levels, but I was fascinated to see that you'd written this play, uh, Big Mama Speaks. And I guess I wanted to ask you about that a little bit and how you see art as a possibility to engage a different kind of conversation than history might, or than a memorial, a physical memorial might. And what inspired you to write that play? Um, so I guess you sort of touched on it. I'm interested in reaching uh, different kinds of audiences. So after I wrote Black Wall Street, I actually wrote a book called Up From the Ashes, which is a book written on the third grade reading level. It's illustrated because I thought, you know, young kids can understand some basic concepts like um, they're, they're into right and wrong and um, brotherhood and sisterhood and kindness and those kind of concepts. So I, when the book first came out, I went to a number of second and third grade classes, read the book with the, with the kids, got great questions. They get the fundamental, um, the fundamentals of, of the story, bad things, good things, right and wrong, good people, bad people, nice things, not so nice things. They get it. So the plays, you know, the same sort of thing. You, it opens up new audiences uh, using a new d device. It's a one woman show. It's really kind of a vignette. Uh, Vanessa Adams Harris, is the actress she is absolutely superb she trans she transforms herself into a to a really aged woman and she tells the story in a way that really tugs at the heartstrings um it's something that i i probably couldn't do in the way that i write narrative so it's it's been it's been great uh, the other thing that your question brings to mind is that i was asked to moderate a discussion at one of the museums here, Gilchrist Museum, about Norman Rockwell's civil rights era uh, work, which highlighted um, segregation and discrimination. And I'd never thought about that, never looked at the, but in looking at that, at his pieces, what a great jumping off point. And that that, that just attracts a different kind of crowd. And then you could have these, these hard, conversations with them based on art instead of coming from a purely social justice perspective you come from a real sort of uh, concrete arts perspective it's um it takes real dedication and a lot of thought to to imagine telling these stories in these many different ways um it sounds like you you've worked Kind of inductively you, you've tried different things you got interested in different aspects of it and, and you do that and then you go on to the next thing and you go on to the next thing absolutely so what's next what's after 2021 then how do you keep the history and the and the interest vital well from the centennial commission perspective we've always seen this as a long haul i mean we've never seen we've, we've never envisioned just having a a gala event in 2021 and that being the substance of our work. So the Greenwood Rising, the History Center will be ongoing, of course. So that will probably create a number of different kinds of opportunities for for teaching about this history and engaging folks. So I'll be involved in that way. I have a new book coming out next month called Black Wall Street 100. And so that book uh, will be will keep me busy, I'm sure, for a, a number of months. I'm involved directly in a lot of things in the community that uh, are are beyond simply the the commemoration of this this event. I'm, I'm really invested in diversity, equity, and inclusion more broadly, and that's a long term uh, passion of mine. And I'll continue to be engaged in that. I want to remind people you've been listening to COVID calls and uh, please join me Monday. I'm going to be talking to Roberto Morris, city planner from Santiago, Chile. We're going to talk about planning in cities in an age of pandemic. And I want to thank my guest today, capping off a really remarkable week of conversations. Hannibal Johnson, what an honor to speak with you and to learn about the many things that you're, you're doing there. I know you have a very busy weekend probably ahead of you. So thanks for making time for this discussion. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great to be here. Join COVID calls every weekday from 5 to 6 p.m. Eastern Time. Hannibal, stay healthy and the same to everybody else, and we will talk to you soon. Great. Thank you.